category theory, a remarkable area of mathematics that can reveal deep connections between polar opposite disciplines. But did you know that there were six discoveries that followed one another without which category theory would never happen? Tell me. How did it all start? The origins of category theory are deeply connected to the development of group theory and topology. And these are areas that started to highlight the importance of structure and other relationships in mathematics. Group theory as a formal mathematical discipline began to take shape in the 19th century. It was initially developed to study the solutions of polynomial equations. The key figure in this development was Evariste Galois, who in the 1830s introduced what would later be called Galois groups. These groups Groups describe symmetries in the roots of polynomial equations, revealing that the solvability of these equations could be understood in terms of group operations. Imagine you have a set of objects, like a collection of different shaped keys. Group theory examines how these objects can interact with each other through specific operations, like fitting them into locks. In group theory, the group consists of all these keys, and the operation is trying to fit a key into a lock. A key fits a lock if it can unlock it, which is a kind of rule or structure the group follows. Now, in a real-life scenario, not every key will fit into every lock, but the structure and rules for which keys fit which locks is what group theory wants to understand. And how about topology? Topology began to emerge as a field distinct from geometry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A key development in topology that influenced category theory was the introduction of topological spaces and the continuous maps between them, a specific example from topology that played a role in the development of category theoretical ideas, is the fundamental group, introduced by Henry Poincaré. Imagine you have a donut. We're interested in understanding its shape, but in a very specific way, by using loops. You can think of taking a string and looping it around the donut. You can loop it around the big hole, or maybe just around a part of the donut. Each different loop you make represents a different way to explore the shape of the donut. Now, consider if you can slide or stretch one loop into another, without cutting the string or lifting it off the surface. If you can transform one loop into another this way, they are considered essentially the same in terms of the space structure. This helped to shape the philosophy behind category theory, understanding mathematical objects through the structures that define them and the structure-preserving mappings between them. I got you, but how did this develop further? Tools like the fundamental group introduced ways of understanding the structure of spaces, and this was done using abstract operations, which is what inspired the formal development of abstract algebra, often referred to as the mother of modern algebra. Emmy Noether's work in the early 20th century revolutionized the way mathematicians think about algebraic structures. She developed theories that abstractly described entities like rings, fields, and algebras focusing on their structure and their relationships between them. Unlike elementary algebra, which deals primarily with numbers and the specific operations on them, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, abstract algebra focuses on more than that. Imagine you are playing with different colored blocks, where each color represents a different type of operation. In abstract algebra, you are less interested in the individual blocks or numbers and more interested in how they interact based on their color or type of operation. For example, with one set of rules, blue blocks might combine with green blocks to always result in another green block. Abstract algebra tries to understand and define the rules of how these combinations work, no matter what the specific blocks or numbers are. A classic example of abstract algebra is group theory. A group is a collection of elements with a single operation that combines two elements to form a third element, while also satisfying a few rules. Closure. Combining any two elements produces another element within the group. Associativity. The way elements are grouped when performing operations doesn't affect the outcome. Identity element. There is an element, think of it as a natural or zero element, that when combined with any other element results in the other element. Inverse elements. For every element, there is another element that, when combined with it, results in the identity element. If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. This was close to the time when the term category theory was coined, right? Yes. During the 1940s, Sanders MacLean and Samuel Eilenberg were actively working in the areas of algebra and topology we talked about previously. 
Sanders MacLean was interested in the transformations and symmetries inherent in mathematical structures. He was actually one of Amy Nuther's students, so he sort of continued her work going forward. Samuel Eilenberg, on the other hand, had a strong background in topology. Their paths converged around shared problems in algebraic topology. It's essentially translating topological terms into algebraic terms in order to gain insights back in topology. And that's what led them to formulate the foundations of category theory. They defined a category as a collection of objects and morphisms, arrows, between these objects. In their work, these objects could be mathematical structures like groups or topological spaces, and morphisms would be the structure-preserving maps between them, such as group homomorphisms or continuous functions. A functor is a kind of translator between categories. Imagine two different worlds, categories, each with their own objects and operations, morphisms. A functor is a rule that takes objects and operations from one world and translates them into objects and operations in another world, while preserving the structure of how things interact. For MacLean and Eilenberg, functors became a crucial tool for translating problems from topology into algebra and back. Natural transformations. These provide a way of transforming one functor into another while respecting the structure of the categories involved. Their ideas were first systematically presented in their joint paper, General Theory of Natural Equivalence, published in 1945. That's where the field of category theory was first coined. Tell me more about functors. I know they became important for all the further developments that came after that. For sure. I would even call that further development functorial semantics. Functorial semantics was pioneered by the mathematician William Lovier in the early 1960s. Lovier introduced these ideas in his doctoral dissertation at Columbia University in 1963, which was titled Functorial Semantics of Algebraic Theories. Lovier demonstrated that many familiar algebraic structures could be categorized completely in terms of categories and functors, so basically changing how mathematicians could approach and utilize these concepts. Let's consider the theory of monoids within the context of category theory. A monoid is a set equipped with a single associative binary operation and an identity element. Associativity means that for any elements A, B and C in the set, this equation holds true. An identity element is an element E such that for any element A we have the following. Let's choose a category where objects are specific instances of monoids. These could be the set of natural numbers under addition, where zero is the identity element, and the set of strings under concatenation, where the empty string is the identity element. This functor f will realize or model our abstract monoid theory in each of these specific monoids. It maps from the category of abstract monoid descriptions to the category where objects are these specific monoid examples. F maps the abstract concept of a monoid to each concrete monoid. It assigns the abstract monoid to the natural numbers under addition in one instance and to the set of strings under concatenation in another. Suppose there is a homomorphism between two abstract monoids in our theory that respects the monoid operation. The functor F translates this into a function between between the natural numbers and strings that respects addition and concatenation respectively. The functor F provides a way of interpreting the general and abstract rules of monoid theory in more specific, concrete settings. Because of that, the fundamental properties are preserved in each specific case. And category theory found application in essentially all areas of mathematics. Right. Yes, for sure. One of the most significant expansions of category theory came from Alexander Grothendieck, whose work in the late 1950s and 1960s revolutionized algebraic geometry. Grothendieck introduced the notion of a topos, a generalization of a topological space, which is a category that behaves like the category of sheaves on a topological space. This allowed him to work with spaces that are more general than those that are typically dealt with in more traditional topology. This eventually expanded into Topos theory, a sophisticated and highly abstract area of mathematics that was developed in the 1960s by William Lovier and Miles Turney. A topos, or topoi in plural, is a type of category that behaves much like a category of sets, but with a richer structure. 
In classical set theory, you have collections of objects called sets, and you can define functions that map elements from one set to another. Topos theory extends this idea from ordinary sets to something more general called objects in a category. These objects don't have to be just sets. They can be more abstract entities that still behave in a set-like manner. The functions between sets are replaced by morphisms between these objects. Just as sets have certain basic properties, like being able to form subsets or the concept of an element belonging to a set, the category in Topos theory also needs to satisfy specific rules, axioms, that make it similar to the category of sets. These rules ensure that the objects and morphisms can be handled in a way similar to how we handle sets and functions. But is there a kind of higher dimensional category theory out there? Did that get developed as well? Yes, and it is called higher category theory. In a two category, the structure becomes deeper and more layered. Objects remain as in ordinary categories. One morphisms or just morphisms connect to objects similar to the morphisms in ordinary categories. But two morphisms are a new addition. They are arrows between one morphisms, meaning they can relate different morphisms to each other. This can be thought of in terms of layers or dimensions of connectivity. First dimension, objects and morphisms, how objects are connected similar to the basic category theory. Second dimension, morphisms between morphisms. These connections relate to one another, adding a level of abstraction that captures more complex relational dynamics. A practical example of a two-category is the category of small categories, denoted as cat. Elements are small categories. One morphisms are functors, which map objects and morphisms from one category to another, while preserving their structure. Two morphisms are natural transformations, which are ways of transforming one functor into another, such that certain compatibilities are maintained. These provide a higher level mapping between the mappings or functors themselves. The development of two categories and even higher dimensional categories, like n categories, allows mathematicians to model and analyze more complex systems and structures. If you're interested in delving deeper into topology and everything it has to offer, check out this video on topology right here. See you there.